Today's second Bible reading comes from the Romans chapter 3, reading verses 19 through 29. We have ha we, if we have any thought that we may become righteous by observing the law, we need to reform, be reformed by the gospel. But the righteousness that God gives us is apart from the law. We hear. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silent and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Greek, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presents Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on today was the second Bible reading we heard from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 28. As we get meditation on that word, let us pray. Lord, our hearts are in constant need of reform. So by your word, change us, mold us, take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh as we come to see what the law says to us, but also come to see what your blood and your righteousness mean to us today and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so as I mentioned, today is the first Sunday in end time, so from now until Thanksgiving, we're going to have a couple of weeks to think about that fact that one day, Jesus will return, he will come back, and when he does, he's coming to judge. His return is the last day, that is judgment day. Are you ready to face the judge? I guess that really depends on what's the case. Depends on what's the law. Have I actually broken it? Is there evidence supporting the fact that I have broken it? Who's the prosecutor? Who's my defense attorney? All these things are going to determine whether or not I'm actually worried about the fact that Jesus is coming back to judge me. Now some of you, I think some of you probably are very acutely aware that you say along with Paul, I am the worst of the worst. I am the chief of sinners. If Jesus just judges me based upon what the law says, well, I know what the verdict is going to be. Guilty. Sentence hell. Others of you may, hopefully all, realize, yes, I know what the judgment should be. I know the verdict should be guilty. I know that, that that's right and that's fair and that's just, but at the same time, I trust in Jesus' blood and his righteousness, and because of that, the verdict will be completely overturned. I'll be declared not guilty, sentenced, have an eternal joy with God. You know, Paul, when he wrote this letter to the Romans, he wrote it to a Christian congregation, so he knew that there would be people there with either one of those mindsets, but he knew there would be another mindset as well, even among Christians. It was a mindset that looked at the law of God and said, you know what? I did pretty good. 
These laws, I, you know, I, I've done a pretty good job of keeping them as well as I could in so many ways. So when it comes time for my judgment, I'm not worried that God will judge me and he'll say, pat me on the head. Good job. You were better than a lot of other people. You did a lot of good things in life. You should go to heaven. Minds that were secure, thinking that just because of who I am, what I've done, the verdict will be a very positive one in my favor. I think about that idea, and I apologize for doing two movie references in two sermons in a row, but it made me think of a scene from The Shawshank Redemption, where... The main character, played by Tim Robbins, Andy Dufresne is his character name, he comes up and he meets the Morgan Freeman character, Red, for the first time, kind of doing a little bit of an introduction. Morgan Freeman says to him, wife killing banker, right? Why'd you do it? And he answers, I didn't, since you asked. Red laughs. You're going to fit right in. You know, everybody in here is innocent. Is that our mindset? Everybody's in here is innocent. Everybody in here, I mean, we're, we're kind of the better of the best, aren't we? I mean, we work really hard to be good people, and we're even here on a snowy Sunday morning around God's Word in church, so come on. We're doing pretty good. But the law, if it's going to judge us, it's going to say, good job, you're fine, don't worry about it, your conscience bothers you, you know what, just push that aside and say, I really am a good person. I'm innocent. But is that what the law says? The law is really the prosecutor in our trial. The law stands up and says, hey, wait a minute. You're saying that you're a pretty good person? You know what? I, I know what you've done. I know what you've muttered under your breath. And I know what you've thought. So just drop the act. Stop trying to think you are better than you really actually are. Well, come on now. I mean, that, that doesn't seem very fair. I mean, when you compare me with the rest of the world, if you look all around, surely i got to be in the top 50 percentile, the upper echelon. I mean, I, I, I think I'm better than the average person. And the law says, just stop it. Stop comparing yourself to others. That's not how this works. The law doesn't just say, well, if you're better than the other guy, you get to go in. No, the law says... I'm going to compare you to one person. I'm going to compare you to God. To his holiness, his perfection. And if you don't measure up to that, which you don't, you can expect to be condemned. Verdict guilty as charged, sentence held. But come on, law. I mean, really, like, I don't even feel bad about the things you're saying I do wrong. I mean, I may not be perfect, but come on, I'm not that bad. I want to stop it. Just because you try to push down your conscience giving you guilt, just because you try to bury your feelings does not actually make up for what you've done wrong. You've still broken God's laws. You still sin. The verdict still stands. Guilty. Sentence hell. What do we even say? What other arguments can we give? What other defense can we manage? That's the point. As Paul wrote, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. To have that moment where there's nothing more we can say, we know the verdict is right, it is just, I am guilty. But thankfully, that's not where the trial ends. Yeah, the prosecutor has done his work. He has convicted me of my guilt. But then the defense attorney steps up. It's Jesus. And Jesus opens up the good book, and he pleads to the judge, says, let me tell you what I've done for this person. Yep, they are guilty. All my defendants are guilty. Every person is guilty. They've all fallen short of the glory of God. But yet, let me present the evidence. The Day of Atonement, just like what I showed the kids up here, to think of that day again where God took this one sacrifice and the priest confessed over it all the sins of the whole community, everything that they had ever done wrong, all their wickedness, all their wrongdoing, and then that goat was led away, that scapegoat was led away, never to come back again. All sin put onto one sacrifice. And then another sacrifice made, the one whose blood was shed and that blood was taken into that most holy place and the priest would sprinkle it on to the Ark of the Covenant seven times and do this year after year, the blood of the sacrifice covering over the law of God. And Jesus presents the case, it was my blood that was shed. It was my life that was given. It was my righteousness. You can cross-examine me. You can look at everything I have done, and you will find the exact same thing as I said before. You're going to find that I have had no infractions upon the law, that there is nothing I have ever done wrong. I did this for them. I did this for the one who's being charged here today. I did this for you. And it was my blood that I shed, that I gave up to cover over the law so that justice would be satisfied. I paid the penalty. I suffered hell itself. So clear them of all charges. Not because they haven't done it. No, they have done it, but I paid the price. I've taken the punishment. I've taken that sentence. So because of my blood, because of my righteousness, the only just judgment yet to be given is not guilty. Sentence heaven. This is what Christ gives to us as our defense attorney. That as Paul wrote, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus has made the great equalizer by being our defense attorney. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your backstory, it doesn't matter your sin, it doesn't matter any of that, because all are justified freely by His grace. All are equalized in the blood and righteousness of Christ because He held up under the scrutiny of the law, that because He had kept it perfectly, because He had given that life for us, because He has shed His blood, justice has prevailed, and justice has been satisfied. There's only one verdict left for the judge to give to anyone who believes this message. Not guilty. That to you, if your conscience burdens you, that if you feel like, you know, I just, I have been silenced by the law. I never do do enough. 
I'm never going to stand up to the holiness of my God because of Christ. The verdict is handed down. Not guilty. You are cleared of all charges. The punishment has been paid for by Christ and the benefit is yours. So we know through the law we become conscious of our sin. It silences us right in our steps. There's nothing I can do to earn my favor with God or to make it up to Him. But because of His sacrifice of atonement, because of His blood, all that sin has been covered over. And I have peace with God. So we end on that note, the same as Paul ends this section. We maintain that a person is justified, declared not guilty, by faith, apart from the works of law. The verdict is in. You are not guilty. Sentence. Eternal life in heaven with God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which, <clears throat> which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.